Hello, hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Destined to be Free Roundtable, uh, giving voice to the voiceless. I'm your host, Stacey D. Shaw, president and co-founder of Destined to be Free, which is a domestic violence awareness organization. Tonight, I'm so happy again to be able to speak with some awesome ladies who will be sharing their stories um, about, you know, abuse as well as they're also advocates and they will be sharing on their platforms as well. So um, before we get into um, the show, I would like to first introduce to you our first guest, Manette Morgan. Manette is an inspirational speaker, advocate of survivors of abuse, and the author of Finding Your Voice. Manette is a certified life coach from the Academy of Solution Focused Training and American University of NLP. Manette embodies the word survivor after enduring 24 years of abuse that included emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, starting as a young child, Manette's unwavering commitment to self-improvement and overcoming the overwhelming amount of trauma in her life led to the abuse advocate she is today. Manette chose to become a survivor and, and let go being a victim along with her past. This way, she wrote Finding Her Voice, a path to recovery for survivors of abuse. Manette's ultimate goal is to eradicate the cycle of abuse through education, empowerment, hope, and most of all, healing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Manette Morgan. Hi. Hey, welcome, Manette. Welcome. Thanks, Stacey. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so happy to have you too. Our next guest is Kathy Harris. Kathy brings with her over 20 years of leadership development experience. Kathy is a three-time best-selling author, Christian counselor, dynamic motivational speaker, philanthropist, life and business coach. Kathy has a passion for telling her story and sharing the tools she used to not only survive, but thrive. Kathy is a domestic violence and sexual assault advocate who provides messages of hope, motivation, encouragement, empowerment, and inspiration. Kathy encourages people to find their voice and use life stumbling blocks to rebuild their lives. She's the CEO and founder of the award-winning 501c3 nonprofit organization, My Help, My Hope Foundation. Kathy advocates, assists women and children in crisis situation and fights for those who speak for themselves. She's a CEO of Kingdom, coaching and consulting, a, poten a potential in life and business. Through one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, and custom presentations, she uses proven techniques to help women find fulfillment in doing what they love. Kathy is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Wavy TV channel, 10 Who Care Award, the Zeta um, Phi Beta Sorority, Final Woman Award, Hampton Roads, Award. She is also um, the My Hope My Help Foundation was also recently selected as a change maker by the Obama administration in 2017, Michelle Obama and Oprah Winfrey. Kathy has earned an AS in psychology, a BS in Christian counseling, a BS in life coaching, and a BS in addiction and recovery from Liberty Lu University. Let's welcome Kathy Harris to the screen. Hi, <laughs> Hi Kathy. Welcome, Hi. welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome. But as always, to my viewers, before we start, we always like to open in prayer. And Kathy has agreed to open us in prayer. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Everybody bow your head, close your eyes. <laughs> okay. Father God, we come to you this evening giving you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, Lord God. Lord God, we love you and we just lift up your holy name, Lord God. 
Lord God, thank you for this platform destined to be free organization, Lord God. We thank you for this platform to give a voice to the voices, Lord God. We pray that anyone that tunes in tonight, Lord God, that they get something out of what is said um, from any other speakers, Lord God. We ask that you touch them, Lord God, touch their hearts. We ask that if anybody's listening that need to get out of a domestic violence situation or any type of abusive, abusive situation that they're in, Lord God, we ask that you help them, Lord God. We ask that you show them the light, Lord God. Lord God, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for this platform. We thank you for every speaker that has agreed to speak tonight, Lord God. Thank you for giving everyone, all the speakers and Stacy the strength to do something like this, Lord God. We ask that you just bless everyone that's listening. We ask that you bless all the speakers, Lord God, and use everything that happens this evening for your glory, Lord God. Thank you. And this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Kathy. I so appreciate that wonderful prayer. Thank you. <laughs> So um, ladies, how I like to start off is really, I like um, for you, I have read your bios. I've told people, you know, who you are, what you have done, but I like to ask you personally to tell in your own words who you are and then, you know, go straight into your story. So let me start off with Kathy. Kathy, let's tell the viewers who you are and go straight into your story. Well, I mean, you 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 read my bio, but those are you know those titles and everything really mean really don't really mean anything to me. It's just something we just have to put behind our name for organization purposes. But I'm just a servant, you know. I'm a servant of God. That's why I, I sum it all up as um, I am a survivor, like you read, of domestic violence and sexual assault. So my story is um, in a nutshell, because it's, it's a long story, um, but it, it starts with um, just several abuse, being, being in several abusive relationships, growing up in a home, well, first growing up in a home where I saw abuse, um, saw my mom being abused, and I... Um, thought that was the way that you were supposed to be in a relationship. I thought that was um, the way that a man showed you love. So I took that into, you know, my, in, into growing up in my relationships that if a man put their hands on you or treated you a certain way, they showed, you know, that meant that they loved you. Um, I found out later on it was not true, but it took me to go through several domestic violent relationships to realize that, you know, that wasn't the way a relationship was supposed to be. And the ultimate um, relationship or that I had that actually was the breaking point that actually was um, the, 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 the marriage actually where I was set free from abuse. Um, I call myself the generational curse breaker for my family um, because the abuse, um, you know, I decided the abuse was going to stop with me. Um, when I, I, I come from a family of abusive relationships, my grandmother was abused. My mother was abused. I have aunts that were abused. Um, my sister was abused. You know, I was abused. So it's kind of, you know, it, it just kind of, you know, it was a ripple effect. So, um, you know, I believe that God helped me to break those chains and he is using me to um, give a voice to those who cannot speak for themselves and um, and also to help those who have been through domestic violence situations get out of that situation and live their life like they're supposed to be living it. But um, the ultimate abuse came from my uh, marriage. I happened to um, marry someone um, who I thought <laughs> was, like most of us, the, the love of my life. <laughs> you know, thought I had hit the jackpot. You couldn't tell me that I hadn't married the man of my dreams. Um, very nice, very kind, and, and all this at the beginning. And then um, actually only six months into the marriage is when I found out that um, he was actually a fraud. 
Um, he was actually a, a, a beast. Uh, I call him a demon. Um, it's where I realized that um, this man was not who he said he was. And um, it started off with um, just, you know, name calling, um, being very controlling. I had to be home a certain time. Um, if I took too long to come home, it was an issue. Um, you know, if I if I drove, I had to go a certain way. I had to drive a certain way. If I didn't get home or go somewhere a certain way, he timed it. Well, you didn't go this way. It was, you know, it started off little things like that. And then it started off with like, it didn't, I mean, and then it also it, um, ran into like choke holes, um, you know, the, the little things like that first, um, grabbing me, um, the name calling, um, you're not going to be anything, you know, um, and things like that. And then it escalated into, um, you know, the, the, the punching and, um, and things like that. He um, broke my hand one time. Um, you know, um, he would always hit me below the neck um, so that I would not have any bruises. And so that was one of his, one of the things that he did. And um, so um, after three, after three times of leaving him, well, after twice leaving him, the third time um, that I went back, it was the last time. They say that after woman takes um, seven times to leave their abusive relationship, it took me three. Um, that third time, I've had I had had enough. Um, and what prompted me to leave that third time was him trying to poison my son and I. He tried to poison me and my son by putting things in our food. Um, I got very sick. And um, it was that same week that I got sick, went to the emergency room. They could not, they did all type of tests, could not find anything that was wrong, no traces of anything in my blood. But I found battery shavings um, on the kitchen counter that he had left um, hastily. I guess if he rushed out of the house, he had been putting the battery shavings in our food um, because I had a headache that was just out of this world that I know it came from that. And that just told me that I needed to get out and to get out safely. So I called a bunch of my um, my girlfriends and they helped me pack up my stuff and and I got out of there. And it was um, when I left was when I, well, actually right before I left is when God started showing me that, you know, that abuse was wrong. I should, you know, this, this you know, I started seeing things in scripture and um, it's when I learned that what he was doing, you know, was not the right thing to be doing to his, to, you know, to to his wife, you know. And so I started just, you know, looking at a lot of things and, um, you know, reading scripture, reading up on domestic violence and just started educating myself. I started going to volunteering at a shelter and things like that. And that's when I think I discovered, you know, in, in between, you know, right after that is where I really discovered my true calling, which I believe God, you know, wanted me to help other women. Um, the first time I left my abusive relationship, I could not, um, find anywhere to go they wanted i wanted to go to the shelter but they wanted me to go in one shelter and wanted me to place my son in another shelter he was 16 years old at that time okay i was not leaving my son in a shelter by himself <laughs> so i was forced to go back to my abuser because we really had nowhere to go some of some of those rules have changed now you know they'll let the the child come with the mom in a shelter, you know, if, regardless if they're, you know, 15, 16, something like that. But back then when I tried to leave, my son is 20, my son is 29 now. Okay. So he was 16 at that time. They wanted me to, I couldn't believe it. it you want me to put my son in a shelter by himself somewhere else. And then you want me to go in a shelter. So I just felt, you know, that, that that wasn't the right thing to do. And that's another thing why advocacy is very important because there would have been, there would, there were other resources for me, but I didn't know. So that's why I was forced to go back to, you know, my abuser. Had I known there were other resources and other help, had I known how to reach out and do certain things, I may not have went back that second and third time. 
you know, but I didn't know. So that's why organizations like yours and mine and different organizations are so important and spreading the advocacy, advocacy and, and, and sharing resources is so important. So people know that they know, you know, people know how to get the help, the proper help that they need, because a lot of women do go back because they feel like there is no help available there's nowhere to go they don't have anywhere anyone to turn to and there is you know t versus back then and now there is a lot more help available um you know to to um to those leaving those abusive relationships so i don't want to take up a lot of time you know telling my story but because um, i know there, there's there's so much so i try to put it you know try to sum it up in a nutshell but um I don't know if I can talk about this now, but my whole story is in my first book. I, I do have a book uh, where I share my story about domestic abuse. It's my very first book that I wrote um, uh, called Love's Got Everything to Do With It. I kind of got the idea from Tina Turner's book, um, What's Love Got to Do With It? And my book is called Love's Got Everything to Do With It, When, Love's help, when Love Hurts because love does have everything to do with it, you know? And it was kind of like an off spin to hers because she's asking, what does love's got to do? What's love got to do with it? It's everything. Love has everything to do with it because I believe love does not hurt, you know, so. That's true. Well, Kathy, um, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm so glad that, you know, you could walk away and now become an advocate for women, which we will actually get into more that you can share about that. Okay, thank but you. you are very welcome. So let's go to Minette. Minette, um, same thing that um, I had asked Kathy, share who you are, share and go straight into your story. You know, what, mm -hmm. ha what happened with you? Sharing and writing a book about it because I know how hard that is. <laughs> so way to go, Kathy. Um, I am a speaker, uh, author of Finding Your Voice, A Path to Recovery for Survivors of Abuse. I have been a life coach for, oh my goodness, I guess 10 years. Um, I am an advocate for survivors of abuse. I have taught classes, workshops, done speaking, media, you name it. I've done a little of all of it. Probably not a lot of any of it, but a little of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I feel that everyone has a story um, out there. Everyone watching this, I'm sure, has their own story, just like Kathy had. Um, they're all different, and I think they're all challenging in some form or fashion. I personally was born into a family with a dad that was emotionally abusive and full of rage is the best way to put it. Um, I had an amazing mom, loving, caring, a little bit on the codependent side, but she was a loving and caring woman. And I think it's a savings grace I had her because it's why I'm the woman I am today and how I survived all the things I survived. My dad grew up in his own abusive family, just like Kathy was talking about. This stuff is, you know, it's a cycle. And he was so, so, so angry. And he grew up with a, you know, detached father who was an alcoholic, a mother who was literally, literally mentally unstable. I mean, one of his stories, just to let you guys know, uh, one morning, one Sunday morning, they were going to go to church. And his dad was going to take him to the Methodist church and his mother was not going to have that. So she got a butcher knife and held it to his throat, said, I'll kill him before you take him to that church. That's the kind of atmosphere he grew up in. So, you know, when I was young, I was very angry at him for being so angry at us and so emotionally just mean and tormented because depending on how his day went was how our evening went, you know, cause it could be anything from I spilt a glass of tea and got a spanking with a belt to he never was the type, just by the way, guys, he never was the type took his fist and hit you. It wasn't like that. And he wasn't abusive to my mom, which was crazy. But us kids, we got all the anger, all of the frustration. 
And it was just hard. Uh, you know, I grew up on a little farm and little blue and white trailer house falling apart and by my grandparents and it, in Texas. And it was just hard. It, it, you know, you just never knew what you were getting. It, you know, it's like like you said, when you married your husband, you know, he's this amazing guy or when you first were with him. My dad could be so cool with other people. But in our home, he was nothing like that. So it was really, really hard and, and really challenging as a young child with him. From there, by the time I was eight, um, I started uh, being sexually abused by an older cousin. Basically, um, I'll never forget the first time. Um, he trapped me in the barn when we were feeding cattle and he took off my clothes and molested me and it went on every week for almost five years. I was raped and he was careful too. Cause I, you know, I went through all those stages that I think women of any age go through where you first are confused and dazed and in shock. Then you try to fight. That doesn't do any good. You just get hit and beat up. Then you, try to compromise and bargain, you know, with him. And for me being such a young child at eight to 13, I, you know, was trying to bargain with God to save me and make this stop. And as a young child, I felt like I was forgotten. He didn't even know I was there. It was horrible. Um, and by the grace of God, I guess you could say, I was 13 and my mom told me about the birds and the bees and I was very sheltered. I lived on a little farm, you know, in a little town, you know, I wasn't exposed to much. And my mom told me about this and I went to him and told him that I had become a young woman. I, you know, had started my monthly and he left me alone. I was so fortunate, so fortunate. It didn't continue any longer, but the damage was done. I was pretty beat up. I was, um, I had no self-worth by this point, uh, no self-respect. And he was, he was a great manipulator, like all abusers. He convinced me that I had created this situation. It was my fault. Um, I was this dirty little girl. No one would ever have me or love me. Um, that if I told my dad would believe him, not me, because my dad was so angry, he would take it all out on me. Um, it was just messed up from the beginning in my life, unfortunately, just a lot of manipulation, a lot of control. I didn't trust men. I was scared to death of men. I was scared of everyone, to be honest. On top of all this, just to make it even worse, I'm dyslexic. And in school, I, I couldn't read or write or anything. I was illiterate. And kids and teachers alike would make fun of me. Um, so my self-esteem, the reason I'm sharing that was pretty beat up. <laughs> I was pretty beat up and, uh, you know, I was headed down a path of that for a lifetime personally, I think. Uh, from there, I went on and at 15, I started dating. Oh my gosh. I just like you, Kathy, you thought he was amazing. He was charismatic and, and just so full of life and the big smile and, um, and for me, I was a sucker. He's blonde hair and blue eyed. And <laughs> I just, I just was like, I couldn't see what he saw in me. I was like, Oh my God, he likes me of all people who isn't worthy of anything at that point. Um, and by that point I wasn't even aware of what I was doing to myself because I was really good at putting on this big smile. I could do it. Well, I was a good actress and Behind the scenes, I would sit in my room at night and stick my fingernails in my legs. I never thought of a razor blade, thank goodness. Um, would make myself bleed. I would uh, starve myself to be thin, borderlining anorexic at times and bulimia. Um, I just, I hated myself. And a lot of the self mutilation things I would do is, it took me years, years of therapy and stuff to understand that it was, I wanted my insides to match my outsides. My insides were in so much pain and agony. I wanted my outside. I wanted to feel what that was. And so all of that being very messed up, 
<laughs> but we all know these are some of the consequences of abuse. Um, I started dating that great guy in high school. Thought I had it made, thought he loved me, thought he cared about me. He turned out to be narcissistic and the biggest gaslighter you've ever met in your life. And I'm going to take some ownership in this relationship with you guys. Because of my childhood, I was beat up and I didn't, you know, I just didn't think, you know, I was like, well, okay, this is what I deserve. This is what I need. This is what I deserve. And just like you talked about in the beginning, it was just manipulation and control. And then it got more and more. And I was lucky. I didn't have what I call someone that stopped and controlled every aspect of my life. He wasn't like that. He was too arrogant and wanted to do his own thing. Um, but by the end, when I started trying to stand up for myself a little bit, he started doing things like play with the gun in the living room and let me know that he could kill me if he wanted to play with the knife. I can take you out. You know that and laugh. And then when I would be like, that's not funny. He would be like, yes, it is. I'm just kidding. And I don't know if you ladies have done this or, or the, the famous words. Oh, you're way too sensitive. And what's the other one? Um, oh my goodness. The other one is, you know, I wouldn't have to do that if you wouldn't act that way. How many of us have heard those words? I mean, it's, it's horrible. And that was the experience I had. I was lucky. I don't know why. It was kind of like the other time. I think I was just working because we were together almost 10 years. I married him when I was 19, but it was barely two weeks of 21 when I had my first child. Two and a half years later, I had my daughter. Um, and one morning I was cleaning house, working on my stuff. And I saw this lady on TV on a talk show and she talked about depression and she talked about she was a victim and had survived abuse. And when she spoke, I think I was just ready to hear. I was 23 years old. And for the first time in my life, I thought, you know what? I need to do something. I need to get out. So that's when I started my own healing journey. It was group therapy, a therapist for three years, self-help like you wouldn't believe and being someone dyslexic. I couldn't read guys. I don't know. It was crazy. <laughs> I would beat through those self-help books. Um, but, you know, the amazing thing I think that kept me going is my therapist informed me the cycle of abuse, like you were talking about in your own families. Um, she informed me that if I didn't do something, I would look up one day and be 50, probably weigh 300 pounds, I'm guessing. I would have a daughter that I had taught to be a victim and a son I had taught to be an abuser. And I could not live with myself. So I packed up, I filed for a divorce, I had him served, I went across town to stay with a friend and till he left and then I came back to the house and within a year I was bankrupt, I lost everything I had and hit bottom. I never was homeless. I was very close, but I was so lucky. I was on food stamps. I was I was doing the full gamut, try, <laughs> just trying to survive. But, you know, I wouldn't change a thing and it was worth it. I have an amazing life today. I am so fortunate. I mean, I went on from there and many years later, I married an amazing man. I never repeated the process. I had one boyfriend stalker after my husband and I saw the red flags and ran like crap. I mean, just ran. <laughs> and then I ended up marrying this amazing, caring, loving man. And unfortunately, I was widowed after almost 10 years. And now I'm married to my third husband, who is another amazing man and helped me raise my daughter and just supportive and loving. It's part of, he's part of the reason I wrote my book. He and my mom, they were like, you need to share what you figured out. You need to share what you learned. You learned something during those twenties and early thirties. I learned something and I'm 54 today. Um, I have not been back in abuse or dealt with it ever again. I have two amazing children that have healthy relationships. I'm so proud of them. 
they're healthy and they have, you know, they have values and self-worth and self-respect. And those are the things I like to advocate for survivors. So that's basically it. (laughs) Wow. Wow, Manette. Um, That's such, um, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but thank you so much for sharing that share, you know, from when it started to how you got out and where you are now. Thank you so much for sharing it. Uh, Again, you know, I really appreciate both of you coming on to share your story. Um, There, there's, there's cycles in abuse as both of you um, discussed, there are cycles. um, There's that big power cycle. Can you share with, you know, the viewers, if there's anybody that is listening that maybe going through um, or feel they're going through abuse or going through something. Um, and it will start with you, Manette, and then Kathy, you can pick it, pick up or however you ladies want to chime in. Again, you know, it's a, it's a discussion. Share with the view, things that they can possibly look for, especially, you know, um, coming from a young, you know, from, abuse starting from young age, you know, growing up in the family, that cycle, that generational cycle, share with the viewers some of the things that they possibly could look for to realize, you know, I may be really in an abusive relationship. So Minette, if you could start and then Kathy chime in and let's, you know. I think uh, the biggest thing, I, I do a little chart in my book and it says monsters versus lambs. And I think it's the best way to do it because it's like, I always say, ask yourself, do you feel like you're in control of your life or someone else in control of your life? Do you feel like um, that you're always wrong? You're less than. Uh, Do you feel, you know, dominated, uh, manipulated? I think those are the, to me, the hardcore ones that, if they're a really good manipulator, they just slide in there and, and make you feel like, Oh, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. They never do anything wrong, but you do everything wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and I, I'd never had to deal with what Kathy did where, I mean, he was timing me and controlling every move. I actually, I think this is an important topic. And for anybody looking for answers or guidance on the very first part of my website at minutemorgan.com, I give you a list of organizations to help you get the help you need to get out. Like Kathy talked about, there's, there's tons out there now, but when we left, there wasn't a lot out there. Um, And there's also a little button there you can push. So if you have someone that's controlling and, and monitoring you, it gives you tons of tips on how to keep them from watching and searching your stuff to figure out what you're doing. If you're making a plan to get out, which is always something I advocate for, you know, get help, get out and stop the cycle. So those would be my tips right off the bat. How about you, Kathy? Yeah. You're muted, Kathy. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, red flags. You know, there are a lot of red flags um, to look out for. Um, you know, con- just controlling, um, checking your cell phone, um, you know, timing, you know, timing you when you, you know, do, you know, go somewhere and do something. Um, Isolating you from family and friends is a red flag. Um, You know, not letting you, you know, see your, see, see your family and friends or, you know, um, isolate you, you know, telling you can't go nowhere, you know, and things like that. Um, You know, just, um, you know, the the biggest, I think the biggest red flag, I think is, um, you know, just that, that controlling piece, you know, just feeling like you, oh, feeling like you're walking on eggshells, you know, feeling like you're walking on eggshells, you're not able to be yourself, you know, and be, be free, um, you know, in the relationship, you know, um, them um, monitoring what you wear telling you you can't wear something is a red flag, you know, um, you know, you can't wear that shirt or you can't wear that skirt, you know, you know, and things like that. Um, you know, it's, um, there's a, I think there's a website, um, 
that has um I don't know if it's I, I think it used to be redflags.com, but I'm not sure if it's still called that, but it has all a whole list of um red flags that um you can look out for, you know, for domestic violence. But I think that controlling piece is, um, you know, like number one, because just in watching your every move and being concerned about what you're doing and where you're going, you know, and things like that, um, you know, it'll tell you. And then just if they just change, if they just, you know, they uh, them turning from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, you know, if they just change all of a sudden. They're nice. They're nice. And then all of a sudden they get you know, they get mean or is, is, is a change in how they, you know, how they act. And these red flags, you know, they, that's that's a sign. Get out. Get out right now. Run, run right now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait. Yeah. Run, you know, look, run crawl, Whatever. Run. By the way, there's also helporg.com. That's also on my website. And that's another great resource to kind of mm -hmm. Test and evaluate. Are you mm -hmm. in an abusive relationship? Or yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah, sometimes care. it's really confusing. It's like we were talking about when you grow up in that and that's your normal. Mm -hmm. That's all you know. I mean, all I knew was a ranting, crazy father and then, you know, people taking advantage of me and using my body how they want it. I mean, you know, God forbid I was married to my first husband and he was actually abusing my body as well. I just didn't know it because that's all I know. So I think it's just like you're talking about. It's learning what's normal, what's not, and, and getting clear on that. What is healthy? Mm -hmm. you know, I remember going to the therapist and them going, you need a healthy relationship. And I was like, well, what is a healthy relationship? I don't know what that is. <laughs> right. And, and if you didn't grow up in a healthy relationship, you don't know what one is, you know. So, um a lot of people always ask me when I share my story, when I speak or something like that, did you know, did you have red flags? Mm -hmm. were, there, were there signs? Well, not really, because like I said, I thought it was a normal thing. But when in hindsight, you know, if, if I was to go back and think about at the beginning, were, was there a sign? Because, because excuse me. Because like I said, he was very nice, you know, very nice at the beginning and, and you know, whining and dining me and things like that. But if, if when I thought back through the process, I thought, you know, it was one time that I that was like a, a sign that if I had known, you know, I would have ran. And that was we he, he I had a truck. And he had a car. My truck was better than his, um, meaning that it was more reliable mm -hmm. and it looked nice, nicer. So when we would go, you know, places, we would drive my truck, you know, um, naturally. I would, you know, it was just a natural reaction is my truck. So when we would go places, I would get in the driver's seat and drive my car. <laughs> OK. Well, this went on, right, this went on for a while, and then one day when we were driving, he said, "Um, you know, just out the blue, he said, I guess he mustered up the nerve to say it. He goes, he said, you know, I don't like being chauffeured. Mm -hmm. You know, he he didn't like being dr driven around. Okay, now back then, I didn't know." OK, I didn't know. But later on, I found out when I thought about, OK, what sign did I see or what could I have known about this man that would have, you know, when I thought back, make me think that he was a narcissist and this and that, you know, and, and all that. It, him not being able to drive made him not be in control. See, if he see, he felt that he didn't have control if he wasn't driving. Mm. That's, you know, that's deep because from a narcissist point of view, you know, if you're a narcissist, you know, you, you're you're not in control if you're not if you're not driving. He, you know, it's look, he looking at it like I'm the one in control. You know, he's in, he don't he doesn't feel, you know, how, you know, in, you know, big macho and, you know, how they act and all that being in the passenger seat, yeah. you know. So that was the only one sign that I could think of 
But back then, like I said, I didn't know. So I was like, oh, you want to drive? Hey, you can drive, you know, go ahead and drive, you know. But it was so much more than that to him. You know, driving did something to him. Him being in that driver's seat, you know, made him feel a certain way, you know, and not being able to control stuff. He didn't know how to he didn't know how to act. But like I said, back, you know, I, I didn't know. You know, I didn't know. You know, so is this is this like you said earlier, man, just being uncomfortable, just being in an uncomfortable situation. If you if you go from the person being nice and then being uncomfortable, then something if you feel a certain way, reassess the situation, something that's not right. And nine times out of ten guys, for those listening, if they say they're not gonna do it again, yes they are. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes they are. <laughs> don't need to don't need yeah. to too. It reminds yeah. me of my husband. His one of his control mechanisms that he loved to do is if it's something he wanted to do, we always left on time. If it was mm-hmm. something that had to do with my family mm-hmm. or my work, oh my gosh, he is going to make us be late, no mm-hmm. matter what. And it was him controlling and manipulating my life. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. You are so right. How many times did I take him back? Because he said. Mm-hmm. I will do it again. I'll change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fa- that's a fa- that's one of the famous um famous. Statement, famous statements. I won't do it again. I'm so sorry. You made me do it. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You, you made me do it. I won't you do made it. me do it. Yes. <laughs> don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. If you're listening, please don't fool yourself. I don't care how fine they are. I don't care how nice they are. I don't yeah. care what they do for you. Mm-hmm. It, they're, they're gonna do it again, and it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. And, worse. And, and and if you you know get out, get out safely because there's a lot of people that have lost their lives. This, this domestic yes. violence, yes, yes, serious. And, you know, it's serious, and it happens every day, three hundred sixty-five days a year. As a matter of fact, every nine seconds. So yes. it's very serious, <clears throat> and you should get out. Don't don't take their word when they say they're not going to do it again because they're going to do it again. I'll guarantee you that. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. But actually, if you think about it now, on the flip side of it, there are people that will actually say to um, survivors, "Why did you stay?" Now that is one of the questions that. I will tell you, that's one of my pet peeve questions. And mm-hmm. I always stop asking survivors that. Why mm-hmm. the, you d- the control is a big thing. Mm-hmm. And once they manipulate you, once they get a hold of your mind, what fear? I mean, mm-hmm. if you could, um, Kathy, starting with you, if you could share with the viewers, you know, some about that. When um, somebody may ask, why did you stay? Um, share with the viewers, first of all, possibly, why did you stay? Although I, that's not a question that I like, but also share with the um, somebody who may be listening and tell the, you know, don't ask survivors that. That's mm-hmm. one of the questions that you don't ask. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not a good question to ask. Um, uh, my um, ex-husband family, his sisters actually um, asked me, um, well, they didn't, this is what they said when I left. They said, um, well, in, in, well, one of the times that I left, in between that, they said, if it was that bad, why did you stay? That's how they said it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, minimizing, you know, the situation. But, um, yeah, why, why did I stay? Um, the first time I stayed, like I explained, was because my son and I, um, couldn't find anywhere to go. So I was forced to go back to, you know, him. Um, the second time, um, you know, that I, well, I went back. The first time I left, I went back for that reason, okay? The second time I left and I went back after the second time was because of the famous stuff we just talked about. Yeah. I'm going to change. I'm not going to do it anymore. You know, things like that, you know, supposedly, you know, getting help, you know, and all that believing. And then me being someone that um, that was new to serving God on a different level, um, meaning reading scripture, going to church a lot and things like that. um, I was trying to go back, you know, go back scripture and and not get a divorce and stay with my husband, you know. Um, 
at that time, you know, back, you know, back then it was like, okay, I was afraid, you know, oh, God is going to punish me if I leave my husband, you know, and this and that. And the Bible don't directly say anything about domestic violence, you know. Um, so I was just trying to you know, be a good Christian and stay with my husband, you know, and um, that was, you know, that was another reason why I stayed. And then I also stayed, as well, I got a ton of reason, financial, you know, uh, financial, you know, being, being able to go out there and not being able to take care of myself, you know, and things like that. So there are, there are a ton of reasons why women stay. It could be, it could be children. It could be, um, you know they're scared of the, the 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 you know the perpetrator. They're scared that they're gonna hurt hurt them or their kids. Or they're scared they're gonna take the children away. You know they're they're you know there is so many. The list goes on and on. But you should never ask anyone why um, did they stay. You know that's that's not a good thing to ask anyone because it could it could happen to anybody and there there are reasons for staying you won't understand you won't understand and and this is the thing about domestic violence you won't understand it if it hasn't happened to you you might have a passion for it you might have the heart to help someone who has been through abuse you might have a family member that have been through abuse, but you you won't understand it like we do because we walked in those shoes. It's different. It's just different because if you if if you did, you wouldn't ask those type of questions, you know. And and sometimes people ask those type of questions simply because they don't know. They're uninformed. You know how to speak to someone that's been abused. There's certain things that you should say and should not say to someone you know that's been abused. Okay, you know um, the best thing I think you can do, you know, is just be there for someone. You know, let them know that you're there. Be a listening ear. You know, um, don't try to talk to them and tell them to do stuff if you if you're not informed because you could tell them something that could get them killed. You know, so it's it's, it's 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 this thing is serious, you know, and it's not n- nothing to play with. So, yeah, don't you know, it's not good to say stuff like that. What you got? Um, good. You, mean that? <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're exactly right. And, you know, for me personally, I stayed. The number one reason I stayed is I thought he loved me. He was my childhood sweetheart. And I didn't want to let go of that love because. Let's face it, most of my life, I didn't have much, especially from a man. And Mm -hmm. even though it was wicked and messed up and unhealthy, it was still a little bit of love in there. And I don't care. That's why I always talk about that monster lamb thing. They're not a monster 100% of the time, day in, day out. Mm -hmm. They're actually a lamb more, usually unless they're just a horrible, horrible addict or something mm-hmm. um, and just, you know, so violent. Um, I, I stayed because I felt like he loved me. And to be honest with you, I didn't feel I deserved to be loved and I didn't feel anybody else would love me. Mm. So mm. I stayed. I stayed. And financially, he had put me in a position. I was a stay-at-home mom. Mm. I, didn't I didn't have a job. I had a little design business on the side, making very little money. And they're good at manipulating and putting you where you they want you to be. Mm-hmm. He had got me in a place. And that's when it gets worse is when they feel like they have you control. Yeah. Yes. Or whatever. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It just gets worse. Yeah. So for me, that's why I stay financially. And I just didn't think no one else would love me. Yeah. From there, though, you guys are so right about not asking. I have interviews all the time, and more times than not, it's men. Mm-hmm. Ask me, why do they stay? Why do they do this? And I'm like, I give a, I think a decent answer for that is I talk a lot about, you know, there's the control, manipulation, and all those things. I said, but if abuse is all you've ever done, if that's your normal, like I talked about, doesn't seem wrong to you. It doesn't seem out of place. You know you're in pain. You know you're suffering. You know something's not right. 
but you don't easily just step away. And that's what I usually try to tell people is don't ask people that. Don't because they're trapped. They're trapped in their home with a man and in their own prisons 90% of the time with no escape. And it takes so much courage, like you said, Kathy, and I'm sure like you said, Stacy, it takes so much courage to build up and walk away, to make that first huge step and walk out that door. And no, anything can happen. Like for me, I lost everything eventually, but it was, <laughs> but it's still the best thing I ever did. I don't care, but it's hard to do. That's hard. Financially, there's a lot of people. This happens to everybody from every walk of life. And there's people trapped in homes everywhere. And I, you know, my advice is if you are the friend or family of someone, just like you said, Kathy, just listen, be supportive listen to them and if they need something from you and maybe they want um maybe they need your phone because they don't want to be traced maybe they need your support to carry them or keep their child so they can go get the lawyer and the things in order or whatever it is they need to leave whatever plan they're willing to make um my advice is shut up listen and be supportive especially if you've never been in that situation that's what I'm gonna say. Exactly, exactly. Um, you ladies, do you know we only have nine minutes left? <laughs> only nine minutes left. Um, and there were so many other questions. Yeah, so many questions I wanted to ask, especially about healing. But if you could share, if you could take one minute and share one thing, whatever it is that you would like to share with the viewers, one tip or something to leave with them, um, somebody that may be going through abuse or somebody who may know somebody that's going through abuse. If you could just share one thing um, right now. Um, Minette, let's start with you. Okay. Um, I My biggest thing, I think the biggest thing any survivor or every survivor needs is their self-worth, their self-value, their self-respect, which leads to self-empowerment. And I, that's why I'm such a component of healing and doing the work, which takes some work. Believe me, I have a book for that, Finding Your Voice. And I take you step by step through that healing process. And it's not just educating you on why you're here and how you got here and what abuse is. It's about the steps that I learned and acquired to heal. And I think it's vital. Uh, the healing is so, so, so important. And I can't stress that enough. But my theory is, is if you heal, help survivors heal, you'll empower them and you'll break the cycle of abuse in their own life and the lives of their children. Thank you, Manette. Thank you, Kathy. Well, um, the advice I would give would be to first, um, when it comes to healing, first of all, everyone heals differently. Nobody heals the same. Can't nobody tell nobody when to heal, how to heal. Um, directly, that is, we can suggest, but everybody heals differently. Um, one of the things that I that I um, that I was successful with, and I think it would help people out, is yes, abuse is wrong. Yes, you know, um, the perpetrator is wrong for abusing us, but what's really, really, what's a really uh, important part. The healing process is looking at ourselves. First of all, asking ourselves a very important question. What was it about me that allowed me to put up with this abuse? What was it about me that allowed this to happen? We have to look at ourselves as well. I'm not taking anything away from the from the perpetrator, but we also have to in that in that when we start healing in that healing process, we have to look at look at I have to look at me. What what is it about me that allowed this to happen? What is it about me? You know, and I came up, I learned a lot of stuff about myself in the healing process. Um, like Manette mentioned earlier, you know, the low self esteem. I had low self worth. I didn't know my worth. I didn't love myself. 
I didn't like things about myself. And I don't know what it is, but narcissistic people and abusive men, it's like they can horn in, horn in on someone that um, is suffering from low self-esteem and things like that. Because they tell you things that, 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 that you want to hear to draw you in. It's like they can see that you're suffering, that you're lacking something, and they they give that to you to make you feel a certain way, to draw you into them. So we got it. So 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 my my advice would be: look at yourself, learn to love yourself. Um, and when I say learn to love yourself, I'm not talking about arrogantly. I'm talking about is a healthy way to love yourself. Okay, a healthy way to love yourself because all this self love stuff going. Oh, I'm gonna love myself and this and that. Okay, no, it's 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 not like that. You know, it's a healthy way to love yourself. You know, and just um, you know, you know, I'm all about God. So read scripture. You know, um, um, you know, pray. You know, and ask God to show you who you are. So going forth, you can get into, you know, you can learn how to spot healthy relationships. You can learn how to get into those relation, those type of relationships that um that mean you good and not harm. The home is not a war zone. Awesome, 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 ladies. Thank you so much. So before we go, I want you to share with our viewers how they can um, connect with you. If you have any books, programs, or anything like that, just share with them right now. Um, Kathy, I'll start with you. Just okay. share any book you have, any programs, and how they can connect with you. Well, I have um, two of my books are on um, Amazon. I actually have eight books, but two of them are on um, Amazon. Love's Got Everything to Do With It, When Love's Hurt. That's my first book about my domestic violence story. I have another book on Amazon called Screams from the Church Pew. That's about church hurt um, because I experienced church hurt regarding this domestic violence piece um, also. And... Um, and then, of course, um, you can go to my website. It's actually in the midst of being revamped. Is the Kathy Harris um, dot com is my website. But you can fo follow me on social media under Kathy Harris or um, Coach Kathy Empowers is my uh, also my social media uh, name. The name of my organization, though, is My Help, My Hope um, Foundation. That's on um, Facebook as well. Um, um, it, um, website is myhelpmyhope.org that is under construction as well too but we have a very active Facebook page um, under My Help My Hope Foundation um, that tells a lot about what we do to help those women and children who need us Awesome, thank you Kathy You're welcome <laughs> Manette, you're up share with, share with the viewers how they can connect with you what programs you have or any books that you have Okay. Um, I, you can connect with me at manettemorgan.com, which is M-A-N-N-E-T-T-E, -E, Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N.com. And from there, you can connect with me through Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. I don't know. Was I missing one? I don't know. <laughs> There's tons of uh, social media outlets you can connect. Uh, follow me. I do lots of inspirational little quotes and thought provoking things. I've started a YouTube channel now. You can hear my story. You can. Um, I'm really working on some question answer things and those will be coming out in the next few weeks. And I'm also starting a whole course, video course for my workbook behind me and my book. This is the book and there's a workbook. Um, there's also a hope in healing audio I offer. And what this is, it's just an audio that you listen to as you fall asleep. And it's so that you can regain that self-love, that self-confidence, that self-respect that Kathy and I are talking about, that which is the, I feel the key component in the foundation of healing as a survivor. So you can also go and download that. That is on um, Audible. My books are on Audible. Uh, all my books are available. Any major retailer, you can get them. You can order them. I won't say they're sitting in a bookstore on the shelf, but you can order them. <laughs> Um, so, uh, also you have questions for me. I love to answer questions about abuse, the topic, advocacy, all these things. So please just go to my website. There's tons of ways to connect and see, I also do the speaking and, um, 
I guess that's about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, ladies. Thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure to have both of you on tonight to share your story, to share your insight and uh, all that you're doing. Of course, you know, the time ran away because there's so many more questions I have for you, but <laughs> the time ran away. I will definitely bring you ladies back on again. So thank you. Thank you so much for being my guest on this week's show. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy, And thank you to my viewers again for um, following us, um, joining us for another round table. Um, just to let you know, um, the book that I'm a co-author of, actually, Kathy, who is my one of my guests tonight, she's a visionary behind Surviving Her, which will be um, released um, in September. And if you are interested in purchasing, you could go to my personal website at stacydmshaw.com and you could purchase a copy, but um, it's pre-release right now. So I want to publicly also thank Kathy for being the visionary behind that and being so um, supportive with um, all of the ladies that were a part of this book. So thank you so much, Kathy. For, um, for all that you have done with Surviving Her. And I would like to remind everybody to connect with us um, on the uh, Destined to Be Free website. That's destinedtobefree.org or on our social media or handle for uh, Facebook and Twitter as well as Instagram is Destined to Be Free. So thank you so much for joining me again, everybody, to, to my guests. Thank you. Thank you, Manette and Kathy. Thank you to my viewers. And please feel free to join us um, for another roundtable, which will be on August 27th, for, um, where I'll be speaking with uh, um, other guests. And um, remember um, to connect with us. And... Um, Reminding you, you are victorious, so keep on rising and have a wonderful night. Thank you, everyone.